and gentlemen, my name is Mark Lowry and I'm the Regional Citizen Participation Specialist for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Office in Stony Brook. I've been facilitator for this evening's meeting. Fortunately, I won't be up here very much because we'll be having some people who have some background knowledge, actually speaking, most of the time. We do appreciate you taking your time, the time out from your family and other activities uh, to come out to this meeting this evening. I want to point out that the meeting that we're holding this evening is not required by statute or by regulation. The next public, legally required meeting will be held at the completion of the proposed remedial action plan, and as you'll see, that will probably occur in about a year. That is not to say that we don't anticipate being out there and talking to the public about the former units of site before that. Uh, at this point, we anticipate that once the feasibility study is done, or right before it's done, we'll be out here to talk about uh, some of the technology options that will be available for remediation of the off-site groundwater. Tonight, Lockheed Martin staff and DEC staff and Department of Health staff are here to inform and educate you about the findings of the remedial investigation that has been going on for the off-site groundwater at the former Lockheed Martin site. We are not here to talk about Operable Unit 1, Operable Unit 1 being the on-site area, the groundwater that's under the site itself. We want to restrict almost all of our comments uh, to the off-site issues, although you will get a very brief update uh, on the remediation activities <coughs> on the site this evening. Many of you will recall several months ago that you told us you were eager to hear about this off-site data. We told you that when we had the remedial investigation data from the former Unisys site, that we would share it with you. And that is the our intent tonight. The data have been compiled and are currently under review by the engineering staff within the DDC. Uh, when the remedial investigation report is complete, has been completed, reviewed, and approved by the DEC, that report will be placed in the public repositories, and you will be notified uh, by the mail and through the news media of your opportunity to uh, review uh, the remedial investigation report. The purpose of this meeting is to provide the findings from the investigation of the off-site work. Again, we often refer to that as the OU2 work. We are not here this evening, again, to discuss OU1 activities, which is the on-site work. As many of you know, we've already held several meetings related to the on-site work. Is there anyone who doesn't understand the purpose of the meeting then? The process we are going to follow this evening is quite simple. We will have briefings from the consultants who work for Lockheed Martin, and closing remarks will be made by my boss, Mr. Ray Cowan, who is the regional director for the DEC in Stony Brook. We will then adjourn to the, back to the lobby, and take questions around the posters as we have been doing since 6 o'clock. And some of you may ask, why are we following this format? The fact is, we have, because of the widespread interest on the other <coughs> two activities, uh, interest extends in Queens, because people in Queens are concerned, um, Lockheed Martin sent out over 7,000 invitations to this meeting. Uh, we anticipate that many of you have had, some of you at least have had absolutely no contact with anyone with regard to this site and really need to start with the very basics in terms of why we are involved here. Others of you have been, you know, right on, right looking over the engineer's shoulder all along and know just about as much as the engineers do. And so you need a different level of questions answered. So our intent is to give everyone the personalized service they need by taking those questions out of the back in front of the graphics uh, that are going to be available out there. I do encourage you to take notes and write down your questions to ask the technical people once we get back out front. There will be no question and answer session in this room. Is there anyone who doesn't understand that process? Okay. So, what's the payoff? Why did you, you know, miss friends tonight to come out here? Uh, what will you take home with you? By attending and being attentive in this meeting, you will leave here with an understanding of the off-site findings of the remedial investigation for OU2. If you take notes and ask your questions to the technical people out front, you should get most, if not all, of your questions answered. You will be better informed about the site and the need we have for you to collaborate with all the parties to remediate this site. Is there anyone who doesn't understand either the purpose or the process of the meeting this evening? Okay, with that, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to introduce Mr. Nick Walkenberg, who is Vice President and Geologist for Arcadis Gary Miller, who is the consulting uh, firm that works for Lockheed Martin. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. 
Uh, as Mark said, my name is Nick Baldenberg. I'm Vice President with Arcadia Scarity and Miller. Uh, our firm is under contract to Lockheed Martin to conduct a remedial investigation feasibility study for the former Unisys facility. Uh, as, um, uh, as technical people, uh, my colleague Doug Smolensky and I will be taking you through a fairly uh, comprehensive technical presentation. We'll show you how we conducted the remedial investigation and we'll show you what we found uh, as a result of all the work that we've been doing over the past two years. I just would like to caution you that some of the concepts that you'll be seeing are fairly technical, some of them are fairly complex. We think we have uh, done a good job at, at uh, making them clear and understandable, but uh, don't feel frustrated if you don't understand them the very first time as a result of our presentation. All of the presentation materials that we have, uh, that we'll show you, are reproduced outside in the hallway and we'll have an opportunity to answer questions. So I want to make sure that no one leaves here with a question unanswered or with a concern that has not been addressed. If we don't know an answer to a question, we will take your name and telephone number and we will give you a call in two or three days once we have the answer. Before I begin a uh, detailed discussion of what we did, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the results of the investigation. First of all, uh, we have learned that uh, no one in the community is being exposed to any chemicals that got into the groundwater system at the former Unisys facility. People working on site are not being exposed, and residents and business owners off-site. Uh, are not being exposed. The drinking water in the community is absolutely safe because even though some public supply wells have been affected by the off-site plume, um, where treatment is required, uh, treatment is required on those wells where it is necessary. Otherwise, the, the public supply wells, we have learned, are not uh, contaminated at all. Secondly, we now know with a great deal of confidence where this groundwater plume is located. We have, we have uh, mapped it in aerial extent. We know how far it has moved away from the Lockheed Martin, from the former Unisys facility. And uh, we know how deeply, it is, how deeply it's migrated. Essentially, it has gone down to the bottom of the Magathy uh, Raritan Aquifer, but it has not penetrated the Lloyd Aquifer. The Lloyd Aquifer uh, we have found to be clean. And, and finally, uh, as a result of all the work that we've done, we now have enough information uh, to evaluate the remedial options or alternatives for the off-site area. As Mark pointed out, there is a remedial system under construction for the on-site area. Uh, it is now our job to evaluate what we need to do off-site. Let me quickly orient you. Uh, what you're looking at here is a slide of our project area. Uh, you have the perspective of being up in an airplane, maybe two or three thousand feet, looking down at an oblique angle on the site and towards Long Island Sound. You see here in the bottom of the slide the gray building, which is labeled former Unisys facility. This is the large building that you see at the intersection of Marcus Avenue here and Lake Go Road. You can see the Northern State Parkway labeled here, the Long Island Expressway labeled here. Uh, here is the Great Neck uh, South Public School Complex, and we are located just about there in the auditorium. Here's Lake Success and the North Shore Towers building here over to the west. We put this slide up to make sure uh, that you distinguish between off site OU2 and on site or OU1. The area inside the purple boundary here represents the OU1 area, or the on-site area, where a remedial system is already under construction. What we're going to be dealing with tonight is the area, all the area off-site, all the area outside this purple boundary. Before we get into our technical discussion, I just wanted to define two for, uh, uh, terms for you. Uh, many of you know what these terms mean already, having come to several of our presentations. 
but I'd like you to keep them in mind because they are uh, the most important terms that you will probably learn tonight. And uh, groundwater is the first one because the investigation we did off-site focuses on the groundwater system. It is the primary route by which the chemicals from the, from the former Unisys facility migrated off-site. Groundwater is nothing but groundwater that, uh, water that occurs in the subsurface, below the ground. It gets there as a result of rainfall and snow melt um, and accumulates in large quantities. We are, we are blessed in, on Long Island uh, by having vast quantities of uh, groundwater as a resource. In fact, all of our groundwater in, on Long Island, except for Queens because that's supplied by the city, comes from groundwater and is supplied to you from big, uh, what are called public supply wells operated by the uh, water districts. Groundwater moves in what are called aquifers. Now an aquifer is nothing more than a rock formation or a formation of sand and gravel uh, in which this, this groundwater flows. You'll see from Doug's presentation that it, had, it moves in a certain direction uh, and it moves in a certain velocity. The second term I'd like to de define is plume, and uh, that is uh, nothing more than a body of groundwater which has been affected or contaminated by chemicals, and in which the chemicals exceed the drinking water standards, the EPA drinking water standards and the, and the New York State DEC uh, standards. Plumes gen generally have a three-dimensional shape. They migrate in the direction of groundwater flow, um, and they generally dissipate with distance away from the source area. If you want an analogy, uh, think of a plume of smoke leaving a smokestack. Uh, it has many similarities to a groundwater plume. The plume from the smokestack moves in the direction that the wind is blowing. It has a, it has a three-dimensional shape, generally conical. Uh, and it dissipates away from the source. The big difference is, of course, is the wind changes. In our case, groundwater flow directions don't change unless we do something, uh, like pumping, for instance, to make it move, make it move differently. For those of you who are here for the first time, uh, let me quickly review how this problem got started. What you see here is a slide of the site you see here Marcus Avenue on the north, Union Turnpike on the south, Lakeville Road uh, on the west. This uh, yellow outline is the outline of the main building uh, that remains. Now, many of you know that the building was originally occupied by the Sperry Rand Corporation, which uh, manufactured uh, electronics components and other components for the military. Sperry uh, ran, merged with the Burroughs Corporation to form Unisys, who occupied the site for several years. Uh, Unisys sold the site to Loral Corporation in 1996. Some of the business units of the Loral Corporation were sold to Lockheed Martin. And uh, in 1999, the site was sold to High Park like success, which is in the process of renovating the building for commercial leasing space. As a result of the purchase from Laurel, Lockheed Martin retains the responsibility to do the environmental investigation and the cleanup at, at the site. Now, every firm that occupied this building up through Lockheed Martin manufactured re weapon systems for the government. Part of that manufacturing process was that they uh, produced electronic components, which had to be cleaned in a bath containing some chemicals which are generally called volatile organic chemicals, uh, like perchloroethylene or perk, uh, and TCE, which is also called trichloroethylene. The waste from that degreasing process went into a dry well area on the southeast corner here of the building. Dry wells are uh, well, these dry wells were constructed by digging a hole about 30 feet deep, filling it with some permeable material like gravel, for instance, and then the water went down into these dry wells. After the water went into the dry wells, they soaked down through uh, what's called the unsaturated zone and got into the groundwater system, which here is at a depth of about 100 feet. 
During this investigation, many people have asked the question as to how a small area like this could have caused such uh, a large area of uh, contamination, both on-site and off-site. One of the reasons we think that that happened is that the companies occupying the site ran an air conditioning system where they were pumping groundwater from these wells along Marcus Avenue, pumping it through the building, uh, through a heat exchanger, and then discharging the water back into the diffusion wells. Now this was a completely closed loop system, so nobody in the building was getting exposed to any of these chemicals, which at the time nobody knew was there. But as you can see with this constant recirculation, picking the contamination up here and putting it in these wells over here, the contamination got spread in the groundwater underneath the site. So this is, while this was the main origin of contamination, what resulted in the large bloom off-site, as you'll see, is the fact that the whole site, the groundwater of the whole site, was affected and was contaminated. Okay, let me just take you through the process that we're following here. Um, when, the, when the contamination was discovered, the uh, occupant of the site at that time was, uh, was Unisys Corporation, and they were requested by the, DEC, the New York State DEC to follow what we call the Remedial Investigation Feasibility Study Process, or RIFS process. And what you see here is a description of that process. The first thing that happens is the site owner signs what's called a consent order, or a CO. This is nothing more than a, an agreement, a legal agreement, which binds the owner of the property to, to conduct certain investigations and ultimately uh, a cleanup program. We follow this process both for OU2 and OU1. In our particular case here, the process for OU1 is finished, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and we are uh, two steps into the process for OU2. Anyway, after the consent order is signed, an environmental investigation is conducted. That's this remedial investigation. We collect soil samples, groundwater samples, air samples, whatever needs to be done. We take that information and uh, conduct a what's called a baseline risk assessment, where we <clears throat> evaluate the potential health effects of these chemicals on the community. And we, we focus specifically on potential impacts to human health. And here again, I told you that as a result of our studies, we found out that no one is uh, uh, being exposed to these chemicals from the site, whether on-site or off-site. The third step is to evaluate all the cleanup options that you have available. Um, but before that happens, we, we sometimes, sometimes implement what's called an interim remedial measure, which is nothing more than a process uh, or a, a system that you can install quickly. Uh, for example, if it, looked like, if it looks like there's some problem which you want to stop quickly without waiting to go through the process, you can implement this interim remedial measure. And that's exactly what happened at this site here. Unisys started pumping the groundwater back in 1991 uh, to help contain the plume and prevent it from, from moving away from the site and to start the whole cleanup process. Uh, that system has been in operation since 1991, as I said. However, it's getting old, uh, its machinery is beginning to fall apart, and we are now in the process of upgrading that system and, and uh, implementing a new uh, pump and treat program. In the process I, we, I've been referring to, after the feasibility study is finished, the New York State DPC writes a proposed remedial action plan. Uh, they take the information from the feasibility study and prepare this plan. Uh, this plan goes out to the community for public comment, after which the record of decision is written. The record of decision is the selected plan uh, for the remedy, and the selection is made by New York State DPC. The site owner signs another consent order, another legal agreement, binding it to conduct whatever is in the record of decision. Finally, uh, the company occupying the site, and usually its consultants, go through a period of engineering design where they actually design the remedial systems and then they get implemented in the remedial action phase. Now this is where we are uh, on OU1. We are at the remedial action phase right here. 
Next time you drive by the site, you'll notice a small building being erected in the northeast corner. That is the new groundwater treatment plant that we are uh, building. With respect to OU2, we are at the second step in the process here. The consent order has been signed and the remedial investigation report has been delivered to the New York State DEC and the Department of Health for review and comment. Okay, that was the process. What did we do uh, as part of the OU2 investigation? Well, as I mentioned before, this study focused on groundwater primarily because it's the primary route by which the, by which the chemicals are moving. We did a very large investigation on the groundwater system to determine where the plume is, where, where it has moved to, how deep it has migrated, um, and where it is being removed from the system. Are there any contaminated wells that are pumping it out to the surface? We obtained and analyzed data from over 90 wells uh, in the area. Um, of those 90 wells, approximately were 75 monitoring wells that were drilled for the purpose of defining the plume. We got information from many other wells in the area, such as public supply wells from the Nassau County Groundwater Monitoring System. Uh, Nassau County has a series of monitoring wells that they keep track of or monitor uh, routinely. Um, and we, we installed 21 new wells off-site for the OU2 process. The groundwater investigation has taken almost two years. This process was conducted from 1998 to, to 1999, which seems like a long time. But uh, you have to remember that we, we have to evaluate a very large amount of data. It takes a long time to drill these wells because we have to drill them very deep, many of them are hundreds of feet deep. Uh, the, the drilling in, the, in this area is quite difficult. And the other main problem was is that the other main problem is that we don't have control over many of the properties where these wells were installed. They're owned by uh, private citizens or by governmental agencies. We can't just go into their property and drill a well. What we have to do is negotiate a formal access so that they actually give us permission to enter their property. In some cases, it took us several months to negotiate these access agreements. We also sampled the air at the North Shore Towers golf course. And the reason we did this is because the irrigation well that North Shore Towers uses for its golf course has been contaminated by the chemicals from the former Unisys facility. We were concerned that when the North Shore Towers uh, irrigated the golf course, people walking on the golf course could get exposed to chemicals that were coming out of the water as a result of the irrigation process. Uh, so we asked the North Shore Towers to turn on their air conditioning system and we sampled the air in the vicinity or at the golf course. Uh, as, part of, as part of that process, uh, well, this actually is part of the, the baseline risk assessment, which I'll describe in a minute. But essentially, we found, but well, we could not detect any of these volatile organic chemicals uh, in the air. So here again, no one using the golf course is going to be exposed to these chemicals. I'm sure some of the, some of the chemicals are vaporizing from the water, but uh, they're present in such low quantities that we couldn't detect them. By the way, we're using the North Shore Towers well here as a surrogate for three other golf courses in the area. There's another well uh, belonging to the village of Lake Success that has been similarly affected by the, the plume from the former Unisys facility. However, the concentrations in the, in the village of Lake Success well are lower than the North Shore Towers well. So we're using the North Shore Towers study as a surrogate for potential an evaluation of potential health effects uh, at the Village of Lake Success and the Deepdale and Fresh Meadows golf course wells. And by the way, the, the latter two have not been affected uh, by the groundwater flow. So two out of four wells, golf, uh, two out of four golf course wells have been affected. We're using the North Shore Tower study to evaluate what potential impact would occur at all four courses. As I said, we evaluated potential adverse health effects with a baseline risk assessment. And here what we do 
is we look at all the routes by which people could get, potentially get exposed to these chemicals. We look at the groundwater, we look at the air, we look at streams and rivers if there are any. Um, and I can report to you, as a result of that study, we have learned that no one is being exposed to these chemicals at this point. We also prepared a very sophisticated uh, computer model of the groundwater system. Doug Smolensky will present the, those results to you, but essentially we took the Nassau County uh, groundwater model and added to it our own information that we developed for the site uh, as a whole. So the groundwater model uh, contains all the information we could possibly lay our hands on, and we've used it to help us determine which way groundwater is flowing, and if you were able to determine which way groundwater is flowing, you are able then to determine which way the groundwater plume is, uh, is going also. In addition to that, we prepared a three-dimensional illustration uh, of this plume to help us understand it, uh, its configuration. Um, one of the problems is that uh, we can't see what's in the subsurface. We stand here on the ground, but the plume is down at uh, you know 200 feet or something like that. We can't see it, so we have to infer with it, its location. We do that by drilling wells, um, but we can't drill wells every 10 feet. It's just too expensive, and it's uh, uh, we would have to gain access to a tremendous amount of private property. So we use this computer modeling and the three-dimensional simulations to help us visualize what this plume looks like. The plume you're going to, the Doug will present, or at least a 3D illustration you're about to see, uh, looks very nice, it's very artistically done and everything, but just remember that it's based on actual data. It's not an artist's rendition of what's happening, it's based on the actual field data that we've, that we've obtained over the past two years.